Hello, I'm Caroline Jones. Welcome to a new season of Australian Story. Tonight's program is about a woman taking on some of the most powerful institutions in her home state and changing the way things are done. She's helped to instigate two criminal trials, a royal commission and a legal conduct hearing, earning praise for her courage and resilience. But Di Gilchrist says she still hasn't achieved the one thing she most wants. She's telling her story tonight for the first time. What? You're angry? <laughs> Taking out your anger on your biscuits. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. The 30th of November 2003 is a day I remember well. The house was full of kids craft projects that I needed to get completed and return to school. But on top of that, I thought, let's make some shortbreads for the girls' classmates at school as Christmas presents. <laughs> Do you have enough of these, Darcy? So I think we need a lot in each bag. Dad came in and said he was going to go for a ride. It was sort of just the general thing, you know, I was used to it, didn't really acknowledge it too much, you know. So he came in, kissed me on the head and, you know, said see a coach and then walked out. How long are these going to put on? So these will take about 10 minutes to cook per tray. So that was about four o'clock. And he said, I'm going to head out Freeling Way. And I said, fine. I said, you know, ride safely, love you. That was the last thing I said to him. How many is the oven at, then? 180, how many did it set? At about half past six, I started to think he's been gone for a really, really long time. Maybe he's had a breakdown. They don't have to be perfect. They just have to look Christmassy. 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 And I tried to call him about four or five times, but the phone wasn't on. It was just going straight to voicemail. Mum, there's only three left. And then Mum finally decided, she said, oh, I'm going to go out looking for him. So me and Zoe stayed here. Yeah, I remember it pretty good. It was a beautiful day, so we thought we'd make the most of it and go for a bit of a country drive. This is the road we're travelling down after uh, visiting our friends. We're just coming up to the Freeling intersection now, where we stopped for traffic, and uh, it's where Tony saw the vehicle. Basically, what I seen was a uh, four-wheel drive. I think it was a dark bluish colour. Yeah, driving at a hell of a speed. Basically, it's driving all over the road crossing the white lines, one side to the other, driving like a friggin' idiot. And I said to John, I said, uh, yeah, check it out, check it out, that friggin' idiot. I continued down the Freeling Road for a while. I saw a police car. I tried not to think too much about it. I thought it's not that unusual. And as I got further down the road, I could see the road was blocked off. And as I got out, I said to myself, please don't let this be because of Ian. And we continued up the road, and it looked like um, there was a ute, I think I had a trailer on the back of it, was parked in the middle of the road, and there was a lot of debris. And uh, this little Italian guy came up. We, we pulled up here, and this is where we're getting waved at. Um, he didn't stop, he didn't stop. He killed him, he didn't stop. Him, him, and I'm like, what, who? You know, who, what? And he's going, him, he's dead. He didn't stop. And I looked behind and could see the guy, and, and I was like, oh shit, it was my pretty well exact words. Oh, I, I thought, yeah, I'll, I'll chase his suit, I'll get him, you know? And um, I thought, uh, I'll be able to catch him, no worries. But uh, John said, oh, I need you here, I need you here. It was one of the biggest regrets I ever had because, like, uh, had I uh, gone and caught him, the guy could have been brought to justice straight away, you know, for what I believe he'd done wrong. Basically, I, I clearly believe he was under the influence of something, uh, the way he was driving. And I walked over to... There were two police officers standing there. And... Um, 
And I said to them, please don't tell me that the road's blocked because there's been an accident involving a cyclist. And the police officer looked at me and he said, why do you ask? And I said, because my husband went out for a ride and he hasn't come home. And they just said, you'd better come with us. And I asked him, I said, what's going on? And he said, there was an accident involving a cyclist. I asked the police officer about the ambulance and he just said to me, one was called, but it wasn't required. I didn't need to be a rocket scientist to work out what had happened. Um, and I, I asked a few questions. I asked where the car was, like what had happened. And he just said to me it had been a single car he run. The road was closed for nearly five hours as major crash investigators examined the scene. The I was a reporter for Channel 7 in Adelaide and within minutes I'd had a phone call from a contact, an officer who'd said, there's a bit more to this, it's a high profile person. I can't say too much yet, but if I were you, I'd start heading out there. So the cameraman and I started driving out there, making the drive, which was about an hour away. I um, thought of a young kid, a young boy, an 18 year old boy, for some reason I had this image of a young kid who had hit Ian and panicked. And I sat there and, and I thought there's probably this poor young kid at home with his family who is so distraught. After being there for a little while, my contact phoned again and said, how's it all going? And I was talking to him and he said, look, the person we're looking for is, have you, have you realised who it is yet? And I said, no. And he said, it's Eugene McGee, the prominent defence lawyer. And obviously I was aware who Eugene was. 49-year-old Eugene McGee is one of the state's most respected defence lawyers, a former police officer and prosecutor. There were two people travelling to Adelaide in a vehicle ahead of Mr McGee's and uh, the driver saw the actual impact in his rearview mirror and his wife uh, noted the registration number of Mr McGee's vehicle and uh, telephone police. And he said his mother lives not far from here. She lives only a few blocks away or a few kilometres away. So I asked what the address was and we drove out there. And when we got to the house, I remember seeing sort of up the driveway a Pajero that had the dent in the bonnet and the cameraman and I were, were shocked. The whole situation seemed totally bizarre that A, there, there were no police at the house. I couldn't believe that a car, the car that was wanted from this hit and run was sitting in the driveway and so obviously involved. Two hours after the badly damaged car was located by Seven News. And then my phone started ringing. Obviously I'd said to the girls I will only be a short while, but they obviously were worried. Um, they'd been very aware of how long I'd been gone and they were ringing. And I, I just couldn't answer the phone. I just knew that I couldn't speak to them over the phone. I couldn't tell them that everything was OK. I couldn't hide the fact that I was very distressed. Um, so I didn't. I didn't answer the phone. I um, instead rang, well, the police rang a friend. He said, uh, there's no doubt that the cyclist is deceased. There's no question about that. Uh, uh, it would be helpful if uh, we could have some support here for Di. We came home and I sat down with them on the couch and I, I didn't know what to say and I just said, you know, I'm really sorry, but Daddy was hit when he was riding his bike and unfortunately Daddy died. And they were just heartbroken. <laughs> they were ten and eight at the time. 
you know, she said, Daddy's gone. And I remember Zoe goes, what's happened? And Mum goes, Daddy's been, you know, in an accident. He's not coming back. And Zoe goes, so what hospital was he in? And it was really hard because I'd grasped it, but Zoe hadn't. That, you know, we, we were never going to see our dad again. And Chloe, who was eight, asked me who had done this, who hid her daddy. And I said, I don't know, because they didn't stop. And she just screamed. It is the fact that after the impact, the vehicle that had struck Ian Humphrey continued on in the direction of Adelaide, but we now know that some short distance down the road it turned off on a side road. Eugene McGee had made, I think, somewhere between 15 and 20 telephone calls between the time of the impact and when he was finally presented to police. He'd called a number of people, um, his wife, his uh, uh, brother, um, his uh, uh, solicitor, uh, and there'd been repeat calls to uh, some or all of those people. Who did he not call? Well, he didn't call the police. I was surprised when we first learned that the driver was a lawyer and someone of maturity, someone who has education and opportunity and some standing in the community, as one uh, thought perhaps a lawyer might have, um, would have behaved differently. Eventually, Craig, his brother, drove Eugene McGee in Craig's vehicle, I think, to Adelaide. They drove past the accident scene. Uh, police were, of course, present investigating and uh, uh, they drove through without volunteering Eugene McGee's presence and involvement in the collision. Once back in Adelaide, arrangements had been made with police to attend at uh, the home of Eugene McGee's lawyer. By the time the police apprehended Eugene McGee, um, six hours had passed between the, uh, the time of the um, accident and uh, his apprehension. We were trying to locate Mr McGee. Um, whether we could have done more, I'm not so sure. Um, the reality was that Mr McGee decided to take evasive action and put himself out of the reach of police on that particular evening. I assumed that when the driver of the car was located that they would be um, tested for alcohol, whether that be by breath or blood analysis, and that they would be arrested and charged with killing somebody. Sergeant Hassel, who I think was the arresting officer, um, in the course of conveying uh, Mr McGee to the watch house, said that he observed the smell of alcohol on uh, Mr McGee's breath. He was, of course, well outside the two-hour period for a breath analysis, which is legislated for. The police um, didn't do any blood alcohol test. Um, there was a procedure available to them, which they might have uh, um, used to require Mr McGee to give them a blood sample, but didn't happen. A couple of nights later, a member of the police force came around, a police officer, and uh, interviewed us separately, took statements, went through exactly what had occurred, where we were, what had been seen. I clearly remember saying that I'd seen the guy driving like a friggin' idiot driving all over the road. Yeah, the police officer said to me, it sounds like uh, crucial evidence. And he, he did say that uh, you will probably have to be uh, given evidence in court and uh, will, will you be available to do that? It seemed like a blatant cut and dry case. What stinks about this overall is there's a wife without a husband, a child without a father, a brother without a brother, I really couldn't think that. I, I couldn't absorb what had happened. I couldn't absorb that I was now going to be alone with the girls. My first job was a correctional officer at Adelaide Jail. And in that very romantic old setting, I happened to see Ian just standing very relaxed in one of the yards. 
So Ian was a correctional officer and there was an instant thing. I thought to myself, I'm going to marry that man. And it was really quite bizarre. <laughs> He was like a big kid as a husband. It was the best thing. When I met Ian, he was never going to have children. And having children was more or less the best thing that ever happened to him because he got to explore that child within. I remember that he was really into cycling. I remember that he used to spend a lot of time up in the shed working on his bikes and he'd always be mucking around with something. Ian was working as a rehabilitation officer for South Australia Police. Ian would work very hard to develop a relationship with his clients. He'd always include a chocolate frog in the mail out just to give them something to laugh at or have a giggle or think he was an idiot. <laughs> but it, it became something he was renowned for. He used to buy about 10 packets of chocolate frogs every fortnight, I think. Ian's coffin ended up being covered in chocolate frogs. He must have had 400 chocolate frogs on his coffin because all the people who he worked with and who he'd been involved with bought a chocolate frog for him and placed it on top of his coffin. I don't think there has been a day since that crash when Eugene McGee hasn't been overwhelmed by remorse. On the Tuesday following the accident, a legal uh, colleague on my behalf uh, on the front page of the advertiser extended to the family my sympathies and my apologies for what happened. And uh, during 2004, on uh, two occasions, I, uh, through uh, Mr Humphrey's brother Neil, who was a solicitor, through his employer, I offered, made an offer to meet any of the family who were prepared to meet me to convey to them but personally my sympathies and apologies and I understood that uh, and completely respected the fact they didn't want to meet with me. I've bumped into him in the streets of Adelaide. He's never once shown any remorse, any contrition and he certainly never ever said that he's sorry to me. Mr McGee is charged with causing death by dangerous driving, failing to stop after a fatal accident and failing to render assistance. On the 19th of December, we went to court for the first time, and that was the first time I encountered McGee. The court heard Mr McGee is such a well-known local barrister, the DPP can't find anyone to prosecute him. So there was lots of courtroom wrangling around whether the case should ever come to any sort of trial. We were concerned that many of the lawyers had been to the same law school. They were people that worked very closely together. I think it's a small law community in Adelaide? Well, it's inevitable that in a small legal community such as Adelaide's, uh, Eugene McGee is going to be known by uh, a number of practising lawyers. He's obviously going to be known by people he might have gone to law school with. But how that could legitimately give rise to any concern, um, I, I find difficult to fathom. McGee's lawyers will argue on Friday their client has no case to answer. How far is it again? It's about 500 k's, honey. OK. The girls and I went to Mount Gambier to be with my family, and it's a five-hour drive. So I think that was more or less the first time I'd had any time to just think as I was driving. And I guess the penny dropped, so to speak, that the person who had killed Ian was somebody who was knowledgeable and educated, and not only in a general sense, but in a legal sense. Somebody who was connected. Somebody who obviously knew how to protect themselves. I don't know. Yeah, something. And I thought, I need to smarten up. I just compiled a list of questions in my head, and I thought, I need to start asking some questions. Mm. 
I just couldn't get over the feeling that the police weren't doing all they could to investigate the crash. This was most apparent when I asked the officer in charge, Dan Hassel, whether they'd found out what McGee had been doing earlier that day. And then he said no. And I said, well, that's a bit of a concern. Have you checked his phone and credit card records? As I imagined would be a fairly... It's what they did on all the TV shows. I guessed it was fairly standard policing. And he said, no, we haven't. The general consensus or feeling was that he had been at Kapunda. I thought I'll go to Kapunda and I'd actually been asking lots of questions and a friend had told me he'd heard a rumour he'd been at a certain hotel. I just had this burning desire to know, not only to know but to try and understand what it was that happened that night, how it happened and why it happened. I went to the first hotel and the minute I mentioned Eugene McGee's name, it was like a door had been slammed in my face. So I'm always came back from there none the wiser. And the girls are doing well and that's the main thing. She was quite clearly frustrated by what was happening. She was looking for answers to questions and sometimes the answers didn't come. Uh, she'll graduate in a couple of months. My name's Michael O'Connell, I'm the Commissioner for Victims' Rights. The first time I met Di was over a cup of coffee, but she turned to me and she said, if you're just another bureaucrat and you're here to silence me, then you may as well pack your bag and go home now. Thanks for coming in today. Oh, thanks I, for meeting with me. I understand you're still having some problems. With this was a lady who was not a lawyer. She was seeking answers to questions about a very strange world, a world that she didn't choose to become part of. You met with the senior police officer? How did that go? I just feel like I'm being patronised, Michael. Nobody wants to give me any answers. Well, do you think it would help if you gave me the questions that you want answered and, and I write on your behalf? And... It appeared to her that the people that she had asked to help her were the people who were putting obstacles in her way. The people that she expected to help her were the people who appeared to have most let her down. Di had been told there had been no blood test, there had been no alcohol test, and the office of the DPP at the time just essentially said, go home, bake cakes, get on with your life, and uh, we'll deal with this. But it's very unlikely to ever come to trial. When I talked about that with my husband at home, we, uh, we thought they'd said that to the wrong woman, really. I had a meeting with the Director of Public Prosecutions, Paul Rofe, and he sat me down and told me that mine was just one case and there were many others. I said, well, that's actually not my problem. I want you to investigate and prosecute this case as it should be. And he got very, very angry with me. He said to me, this case is not going to go to trial. This is going to be dealt with as a summary matter in the magistrate's court. And I turned around and I said to him, over my dead body, that will happen. Someone has been killed. That can't happen. And he said to me, he was very flustered by this time. He said, we could have got it to trial if the coppers hadn't stuffed things up. And he realised he'd dropped the bomb that he shouldn't have. And he said, oh, uh, if they would have taken blood. And I said, let's just stop. What do you mean? They've been telling me for all these months they couldn't take blood. And he said, oh, they could have used the Forensic Procedures Act to take blood. They didn't do that. They stuffed it up. And he said, it's as simple as that. It'll be a summary matter. And I was just devastated. Oh, in my view, it would have been an excellent thing if uh, police had taken a blood test because it could have removed um, all of this speculation about alcohol having anything to do with this, um, this terrible accident. I said to Rofe, there was only one reason that McGee didn't stop, and that was because he'd been drinking. And Rofe turned around and said to me, that was the first thing I thought. The only reason Eugene didn't stop was because he was pissed. A 
And I realised that my fight was not just about Ian. It was about the big picture. It was about the system. So this was the system, and it was overwhelming and daunting to think that at every level it had failed. I found out the trial had taken place and that we weren't called, and I couldn't understand why we weren't uh, brought forward to uh, say a bit. As Attorney General, I want to apologise to Di Kilchrist and the Humphreys family for the outcome of our justice system in the case of Eugene McGee. It probably gave rise to a post-traumatic stress disorder or a dissociative type state when this accident occurred, such that he couldn't essentially bring himself to stop. For a whole range of reasons, including public confidence in the legal profession, I don't think Mr McGee should be practising. I've never been more personally outraged about what I personally see as being a, in the common lingo, a mistrial, a travesty of the justice system. Do you have anything to say to the family? I don't think justice has truly been done. It, it's a tragedy for everybody involved uh, and, and the effects are ongoing for everybody involved. I loved my dad so much and it was, it was like ripping a piece of my heart out.